perfect. Let me set them up so that I can see in the comments that they show up. Come here. Bam. Okay, great. Good morning. Happy spring. Today is the vernal equinox. This is day 99 of 100 days of visibility. And this is, um, <laughs> uh, we've mentioned this before, it, uh, uh, apparently this is my 100th video. So there was some kind of, um, oh, 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 there's this going to be a sound echo. I forgot about this. Let me see if I can just get to the right side. There we go. Yeah, so there's a miscounting somewhere. So this is my 100th video, but I'm going to go to number 100. So tomorrow is going to be the formal. Uh, actual end, um, when I'll actually uh, wrap everything up. Um, the, the, um, <laughs> there's, there's something very, uh, it, it tickles for me that, uh, um, that I just happened to time it so that my 100th video happens on um, the first day of spring. And uh, true to form, the Northwest is just completely blanketed in rain and fog. <laughs> Pretty soon zebra weather will start where it just alternates across like 10 to 30 minute periods of tons of rain, tons of sun. It's meant to make it so you can't mow the lawn, but it'll make everything grow really fast. So um, this morning I read a, um, a really, um, like a, a comment that touched me. Um, so let me pull this up so I can uh, reference this. So this is in the context of um, uh, there's a post that uh, my teacher, Perry Chase, had brought um, forward about, hey, it looks like there is a problem with plummeting sperm counts. Um, this is within our lifetimes. I don't know how true this is, but um, it, like, it makes sense. All, in, in the global information war, all information is crap. <laughs> That's like a good baseline to start with. And then the process of grounding in actual truth becomes absolutely essential for having any orientation at all. That uh, it, um, projections supposedly, according to this article, put the sperm count at zero by uh, 2045, which is shockingly soon, right? Um, so um, well, one fellow, um, and I have heard his name, I think, once or twice, uh, so I'm probably going to mispronounce this. Uh, but uh, Ivan Skellum, I think it is, uh, ended up saying, I won't quote the whole thing. Um, maybe, actually, I think the whole thing might be worth quoting. I put a little blip in the description. Um, and this is in public, so I'm, I don't think I'm doing anything terrible by quoting this. He says, in my opinion, this is why men's work is more important than ever. There are things that can be done, but if the cutting edge of men's work is going to remain that we dare cry, then we're probably screwed. I see that we need to move beyond the phase of focusing only on vulnerability and sensitivity. It's important, but with the whole world filling with estrogen, I care more than a little about us men doing things that stimulate testosterone production. So the, um, the reason I wanted to, um, to bring this up is first off, um, I agree with the energetic sentiment behind what he's talking about. I think there's something profoundly important about um, men's work that goes well beyond just can men be open and sensitive? Can, uh, um, uh, can men respect women? Can they do the work of holding a, a kind of space so that women can do, can, can be themselves, can be safe, can be comfortable? I think that's important with some caveats. A lot of the way that we talk about this infantilizes women and it's uh, ridiculous. But there's there's something very profound and important about men being able to show up in sensitivity and being able to hold spaces and recognizing the way that masculine energy has created a lot of difficulty, pain, trauma, etc. But the, the side of ferocity and being willing to break things down and being willing Again, cultivating a wise capacity to say, yes, I see you're telling me to become more sensitive and you can go fuck yourself. <laughs> like that strength and that ability to cut through the warrior aspect 
there's we, we, we've actually shoved the entire erotic polarity at both ends, masculine and feminine, into the collective shadow. We're much better at demonizing publicly and in law the, um, uh, the energetic masculine. But we demonize them both. We, we reject them both. And this creates a really, um, a, a really complicated problem where when like we, we, we don't have the, the nourishing and complexity of actual energetic feminine juice. Instead, what we have is women's liberation that's taken in the form of uh, women becoming more masculine and having the right to be as masculine as they like. The, um, the, the power of women to embody the enormous depth and transformative power of the feminine is not something that our world has almost any respect for. I'll give a little lip service to it, but um, <laughs> um, I want to zoom in on a couple of uh, particular cases for this. The, um, uh, the case specifically of how uh, sexuality and um, particularly in the instance with men, how men navigate porn. This is intensely telling. It's intensely telling of a particular dynamic. So I want to dive into that a little bit here. But a lot of what uh, I can feel very clearly, and I imagine Ivan here is uh, talking about, is that um, I, I, I want to emphasize, I don't know in terms of the case for sperm count. I haven't looked into this in any depth. And as I started with, all information is crap. That is a baseline of sanity in this world, recognizing in, in the world as it is right now, recognizing that any of the ideas and information and perspectives that you're going to get generally are going to be based on utter garbage. So uh, you have to, um, if you want to have any sense of how to orient the truth, you can't do it by relying on external authority. That's just not how any of this is going to work. And I include myself in that. If you're listening to what I have to say and you're going, well, I don't know, like, do I, do I believe it? Like, okay, great. That's fantastic. Um, just don't get lost in your mind. Your mind is not your friend here. Your mind has become a platform. Almost every mind. Like I include mine in this. This is a huge amount of the work that I do. The, the mind is a platform for a particular type of subtle energy to manifest and to shape, to draw boundaries, to extend the senses. And it is in, uh, because we have not consciously cultivated our minds, for the most part, our minds are in service to things we don't understand. The fact that we can create something like Facebook and then be surprised at the outcome and then after we're surprised at the outcome and we notice it has some bad effects like fragmenting society and making it so that our ability to have conversations as a unified public happen on a private platform where a private company gets to decide what the rules are and that private company's political leanings can have a huge effect on what sort of conversations are allowed. It doesn't matter what that policy set is. The fact that we can see that sort of pattern and when we can recognize it as problematic, we still can't do anything about it. That's not a skillful use of mind. It just isn't. So setting aside the details there, I want to get back to the focus here. <coughs> so there's, there's a kind of uh, energetic polarity um, I, I'm sort of wanting to highlight for those who may not be familiar with how I talk about energetics. I actually do mean something that is comprehensible to the mind, but you often have to train the mind to orient to this. I mean something about as woo or wiggy as um, talking about relationships and relationships having a particular feel or the genres of music having a particular kind of feel. In the most common language we're talking about, that kind of feel, is some version of talking about energy or talking about vibes. Um, this creates some unfortunate things where a lot of communities that are trying to attune to these sort of subtle energetics but have not trained their minds end up coming up with really wiggy stuff like um, believing in forms of the law of attraction that feel right and um, that are unfalsifiable and that actually don't take much work to see 
are false in the way that are most popular. Um, or people believing in versions of quantum mechanics that don't make any sense <laughs> and aren't based on the science and actively don't care. I don't mean to dismiss the care that is in the heart of these people. This is part of the tragedy of the modern world. We don't understand the tools that we're using and those tools end up having intelligence of their own and control us. So I'm, I'm not trying to disparage anyone. I'm just pointing out the structure of things that are true. So when I'm talking about energetics, I do mean something that is tying into stuff relating to mysticism and spirituality, but I don't mean something that is flaky. I mean something that is every bit as real as the structures that science has managed to validate in physics. I'm not so fond of a lot of the, what, what science has validated in medicine. Medicine is uh, insane right now. It is corrupted by forces it doesn't understand and it doesn't even try to study. <laughs> <laughs> despite the obvious analogy for understanding it being through biology. But here we are. We're in a confused world where we fragment disciplines and then claim to know things in that discipline. So energetics, energetics, particularly of the masculine. I titled this um, video, Men, Sex, and War. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling into a quality of energetic force. And this is something that I, I'll, I'll draft in many iterations. This is something that is worth seeing clearly. This is not usually the center of what I focus on talking about, but it's, it's a natural result of the kind of work that I do. Sort of attuning to the lucidity of the mind interacting with the structures of truth. Naming the structures of truth and being in service to the experiential contact with the ground of being. So when, uh, when we're talking about, anytime we talk about the sexual polarity of men and women, it's important to note that we are talking about sex. It's, it's, it's unavoidable. And we're talking like, like sexual reproduction, the way in which the human race has managed to continue for millions of years quibble with the language. Well, was it the human race five million years ago? Well, whatever. But there's, there's no question that the act of a man and a woman copulating is, and for having the woman take the seed, produce a child, give birth, that that's how our species is propagated. Uh, it's kind of strange that we have to be clear about that level of this is what we're talking about in order to talk about reality. But here we are land of madness. Madness before the dawn. <laughs> Whether the dawn is because we wake up and start using our minds lucidly, or because we all die and so the insanity doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so there's, there's this kind of, um, there's sort of an upward and a downward spiral in terms of the energetics of how masculine and feminine poles work. I'm talking about these poles and noticing at the physical level, you have this thing about men and women interacting in order to produce babies. And that's how the biological species is propagated. Now, this is a cross species strategy. Um, but the, uh, the, the fact that it's a cross species strategy highlights something at the subtle level. There is a thing that you can learn to feel, you can learn to see and to touch and to notice in real time, a sort of an energetic force. When I'm talking about the energetic force, when I'm referring to the masculine and the feminine, I'm talking about these energies. The, the energies here are closely tied to biological strategies. So for that reason, you will find that in anything, th this is not a cultural thing. This is about the way in which energies get embodied, what it means to be embodied as a male is that you, your body is more, far more likely to be tuned to operating predominantly with masculine energies. And to the extent that you don't embody masculine energies, there's going to be a tendency for there to be a mismatch between the energies that you're embodying and your body. Same thing with the feminine and women. This is part of 
why men and women arose as structural social constructs in the first place. They're not purely arbitrary. They're actually grounded in something biological. This is not to challenge the um, uh, things like gender dysphoria, um, uh, heterosexual inclinations. I'm not, not trying to challenge any of that. I'm not trying to say that that's invalid. I'm highlighting that there is a reason why there is masculine and feminine and why it is tied to being male and female in a general trend, that this is not just an act of suppression. This is a biological force that causes the subtle energy to exist in the first place. Now, if you're going to find that too controversial to stand and you've got to argue with me, et cetera, I um, don't bother. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, to me, this is the ground that we can start with where we can orient to some form of sanity. And if what I'm saying is um, horribly offensive, that says something about the energetic position that you're in and the difficulty that you have relating to truth. And that's a fact about you. I welcome you to work on that, but I'm not going to wrestle with you about it. So, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the reason this is important Oh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why this is important, but one very practical place that this shows up is when you're looking at the um, the, the sexual dynamics between men and women. There's a very, there's, there's like an upward spiral and a downward spiral that's determined at the subtle level. The, um, the, is so, I'm just trying to, trying to find, where, where's the place to name the start of this circle? Um, Feeling a lot of energy and it's pulling me into form. Okay. So, for instance, there's this classic thing where uh, men have a hard time keeping it up in. Uh, in an erotic encounter, right. that you can have trouble with um, oh, what are the usual terms? Uh, impotence and uh, uh, and premature ejaculation. Like these are like a couple of the common problems. Um, there's a fun neurological thing about the fact that both of those problems are tied to one side of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so they both have to do with stress. Like this is oversimplified because anything having to do with biology is oversimplified, but there's, there's an important arc there, recognizing that basically the reason that happens is because there isn't regulation in the man's nervous system. But the thing that I want to highlight here is the way that the, the female experience of that often carries a lot of um, disappointment and resentment. There's very, very, very good reason for this, an immensely important reason for it. Right? It's not just, I didn't get satisfied. Where is my satisfaction? Like that's actually the masculine energy in the woman. And that's the part that's acceptable to articulate. That's the part that's more acceptable to own. So the frustration and the irritation uh, and, the, um, and the sense of disappointment that can sort of all um, rot into a kind of passive aggression. I'm describing one possible arc. There are many arcs. There can be outright rage. Um, uh, I, uh, I remember the first time I encountered this with one of my own girlfriends, there was a sense of, um, uh, like, I, I wasn't aware of having made a choice, but I, she went on for days about how frustrating and irritating this was to her and how disappointing and and it's just, uh, okay, I get that you're extremely upset. And what are you communicating? And this is a really basic communication glitch that happens between uh, masculine and feminine energies that shows up in the bodies of men and women. So the, the challenge here is that what the female, what the woman is correctly physically picking up on is that the man has not cultivated strength. He has not mastered the ability 
to stay with his own intensity, let alone to face the intensity of the world. Right now this shows up as, this interaction is too hot and boom, collapse. There's a lot of practical things in the encounter itself that this reflects on. Part of the, the part of the feminine power of a woman is her ability to open up into deep reservoirs of her own being and experience a full obliteration of ecstasy. Okay. To really roll deeply into the sense of being. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, um, uh, like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to track something of what I'm talking about is not meant to be uh, pornographic or, um, or violating of the of terms here on Facebook. Uh, but uh, they have bots that scan the language. So I'm trying to be reasonable about, okay, can we talk about the energetics without accidentally tripping up something? So if the language is a little vague, that's part of why I'm tracking something with my mind here. The, um, when, if a woman does that, if she opens up deeply and a lot of the deep um, sense of self that she has been scared to show, that she hasn't had access to, the traumas and deep joys, uh, aspects of her most tender heart. If that comes forward, she needs, for that to come forward, she needs to know that if she opens up and, and lets that out, that the man will hold, or rather it's not just that the man will hold, that it will be held, that she is safe to let go. If she doesn't have the sense of safety, she might not be able to open. And if she does, there will be a sense of violation at the deepest level. So there's a very direct energetic relationship in the act of lovemaking itself, where there is a very deep, meaningful sense of violation from the man not being able to sustain presence. Oh. Yeah, I believe the thing is here. But part of the reason for that, part of the whole point of that, is that there's there's an there's an evolutionary engine behind this having to do with the the role of the masculine as the container holder the protector the warrior that guards the boundaries this is this is not just because of traditional um, um, heteronormative views of what the gender roles should be this is a biological function of what it means to be male or female if um, uh, if two animals copulate and then the female dies, there's no child. If two animals copulate and the male dies, there's still a good chance of there being a child. So because of that, there, the capacity of men to risk themselves to protect their offspring is an intensely important evolutionary advantage for the whole species. I'm not talking about species um, evolution here. You can see the um, the mechanics of how this would work at the at the individual gene level if you won't care to trace the reasoning. The point is that this the um, there's something very powerful about the masculine willingness to die in the face of adversity. That is one of the absolutely most core powers of masculine, subtle masculine energetics, the capacity to be willing to choose to die for the sake of protecting, for the sake of guarding, for the sake of being present, that something is larger than themselves, that they're, they can transform their bodies into tools for protecting what matters. And that is the strength of the masculine. So if the woman doesn't feel held and can feel the incapacity of her man in the act of lovemaking to hold that container, there is a very natural sense of, I'm not going to be protected. This man has not manified himself. He's not, <laughs> this is an actual pun of manifest. <laughs> I think that the word origins are completely different, but uh, but there's something very important about the fact that the 
the energetic work of the masculine. It actually shows up at all the layers of reality and experience, but the energetic work of the masculine amounts to cultivating a capacity to be with intensity. Can, so in the erotic encounter, can the man encounter a huge amount of his own arousal and a huge amount of the woman's appeal and control himself, be fully engaged, fully sensitive, fully present. That's the feminine side of the work, being open, receptive, being um, not just distracting with thinking about baseball statistics or whatever, but being engaged and still feeling that energy build up at intensity, and being able to know where the limit is and to pull back from the limit, to breathe, to integrate the energy. I mean, part of the, um, part of the erotic responsibility of men, like if you want to embody as a man in the world, not just somebody who's in a social position that people call a man, but part of the energetic work of showing up as a man is a fundamentally erotic process at a subtle level that has to do with building the capacity to be with charge and intensity. How powerful is the capacity to stand up to criticism? How powerful is the capacity to step forward and do what's right even when others are condemning? How powerful is the capacity to deal with a blow, to deal with, ow, I've been hooked, I've been hurt, and still hold that and go, that's fine, I have this pain, I'm gonna hold the pain and I'm still going to do what's right. It's not just about physical strength by any means, clearly. Although the, 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 the building of physical strength is the reflection at the physical level of this capacity, how much, <laughs> the, the whole marine thing of pain is weakness leaving the body. This is, um, this is a divorced masculine expression of cultivation of the relationship between the subtle and physical level of the masculine strength. So the, the dynamic, there's a kind of um, downward spiral dynamic that can happen here. Ideally, what happens is that if... Um, if the man drops his responsibility in the act of the energetic interaction with the woman, that, um, that in response to her resentment, he can say, mm, I feel your resentment. I'm taking that in. And that I can see that this is the work that I'm going to choose to do for myself because I recognize the truth in what you're saying. Notice that this is different from Oh, I want to please you. How do I please you? Oh, okay, I need to go do this. That's the scared little boy. The ability to feel the wrath of the feminine and to go, oh, I haven't tempered myself in this specific way. Here is my work. And being willing to do that because he can recognize that that work is right rather than to appease the form of the feminine that's appearing in front of him. Right. That's the ideal reaction in terms of dealing, or something in that direction, in terms of dealing with, well, how do you avoid a downward spiral? But instead what happens is, because we live in a culture where minds don't reflect the subtle level. They're mostly focused on the physical level, on the form of manifestation. They, like, the woman usually can't even articulate what is disappointing about the man's sexual performance and about how much command he is or isn't taking of his own life and why that matters so much to her. Is he showing up erect in his business dealings? Is he showing up in like, he's showing up with clarity and vividness and stillness, penetrating stillness, 
in dealing with throngs of stupid ideas that are trying to poison the human race. The kind of, uh, the, the, the level of feminine disappointment here is hard to articulate because our minds are mostly focused on the physical level rather than the subtle level. And uh, as a result, most of our language reflects the physical level. So you end up talking about lasting longer in bed. It's not about lasting longer in bed. That's the echo. That's the reflection. It has almost nothing to do with that. It has to do with how clearly can the man show up energetically and be in command of his own capacity and build his own capacity, build his own strength. But the, the typical reaction, because all the minds are focused on the, on the physical level, is that the man will then look at the woman's reaction and go, oh shoot, uh, I'm not pleasing her. This is bad. How do I deal with this? And then look for a physical solution. What do I do in order to attract women, in order to please women? Looking at the physical techniques, looking at things like Viagra, looking at I, maybe I can use numbing creams. Maybe I can, I, 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 uh, oh, I need to make sure that uh, she's satisfied first. Okay, well, I can, I can do that. And, but, but all of this is childish. All of it's childish. Where's the real strength? There's a focus on trying to make the manifestation do exactly the right thing. That has nothing to do with it. It's a little bit like trying to avoid getting caught speeding by breaking your speedometer and sort of pulling the needle down. It doesn't help anything. It just disconnects your relationship to truth so that you can't see the reflection clearly. But to make, making this even worse, because the problem is at a subtle level and the, the, the man's experience of this difficulty involves this kind of, how do I um, last longer? Oh, part of the, the problem is I'm experiencing too much intensity and that's tipping me over. So, but that isn't how it registers consciously. Not exactly. Like there's, I mean, there's, there are nuances here, but the, the thrust of it is the possibility of building energetic capacity doesn't even occur. It's not in the realm of plausibility because the mind isn't reflecting the subtle level. The mind isn't tracking the subtle problem. So the man's answer, instead of building masculine strength, is to decrease his feminine strength, which is to say he becomes numb, becomes inaccessible, closes the heart, tries to make sexuality mechanical, focuses on objectifying women. And because you can have arousal without having a sense of intimacy that goes all the way down to the core of the bones and the heart and the blood, all the way in, and then breaks him open. If he, if he cannot if he does not have the strength to handle that, then he needs to block it off so he sort of automatically thinks. Because we have not trained, we have lost the training in our culture for men to encounter intensity, to feel it fully, and to build their capacity to be with what they feel. The closest echo we have is telling men to Feel the pain and do it anyway. Get over yourself. Grit your teeth and bear it. But even there, notice that the thing is not feel the details of the pain. Feel how painful it is. It is an invitation instead to stop caring about the pain, the distance, to dissociate, to become numb, to devalue the feminine. So that struggle, that, 
that whole process results in, right, among other things, um, the men are now, men who fall into this pattern not only start to, um, not only are not cultivating their subtle strength, but they're also becoming more inaccessible. So this is one side, one way to highlight the whole dynamic that has resulted in the rise of women needing to hold the masculine pole. And this is part of why we have this whole energetic arc behind, um, like it's, it's, still, um, it's still more acceptable for a woman to become a kick-ass CEO than it is for a man to be a gentle, caring nurse. And there's still this kind of, like it, it's becoming a little more normalized, a little bit, but there's, there's still this extra bit of tension. Um, the women have more range of the gender spectrum than men do in terms of what culture is willing to reflect back as totally acceptable. And this is shifting, the Overton window is moving a little bit, but it's like there's still a real phenomenon there. And part of what's going on there, like if you, if you look at the energetics behind, you look at, you feel, if you cultivate the subtle senses needed to feel how a lot of, for instance, feminist effort works, it is extremely masculine. It is incredibly masculine fighting for your rights. Like, yes, fighting for the rights is important. Um, but the part of what's missing is that the, um, <laughs> the, the, the whole dimension of transformation by falling into the darkness, into opening into the vast unknown. Letting go feeling more of what's true, feeling the intertwinedness of all of being. That entire axis uh, is, is not, it's not something that's really honored in our cultures, for the most part. I can pluralize cultures there, because uh, when I say, when I say our cultures, um, I'm referring to the westernized world, the world that seems to have become obsessed with the functioning of mind. Without the mind, having a systematic way of reflecting reality. The closest we have is science. <laughs> no one really understands science anymore. Well, almost no one. Like occasionally some scientists do, but not all scientists. And that's its own rant. So when I'm feeling into this bit about um, what Ivan brought up, the thing that started this whole bit. It seems to me that there is something incredibly important about men cultivating the feminine in them instead of abandoning it. That seems super important. And there is this other side, the side of being willing to choose to die. cultivation of the capacity to be present with any intensity that shows up. It's not just a matter of, going, okay, I'm going to do this. <clears throat> That's, that, is the, that, that is the immature masculine, at least trying to mature a little bit. The actual depths of masculine power in this subtle sense come from something that is subtler than even the subtle energetics. It comes from a vast stillness. A kind of knowing that says, that is fine. You can say what you want. You can scream what you want. You can threaten me however you want. You can attack this body. You can attack my mind. I am planting here. Because right here, right now is what is true, and I will never abandon it. Cultivating that, being willing to
to stand up against these juggernauts of subtle insanity that are waging war in the modern world. These corporations and these ideals and these movements and all of this like screaming for blood and cancellation and this and that going back and forth. feels very clear to me that the dimension of men's work is missing right now in any kind of widespread sense is the willingness to stand like a mountain. Along with feeling the vast sensitivity. Both sides. Both sides for everyone. Here I'm focusing on men and the masculine. Um, there's a symmetric thing having to do with women women cultivating the capacity to, um, as uh, Perry Chase puts it, to, um, to uh, take responsibility for their desires. Right? That's another side of the same thing. Right? The fact that, for instance, um, the girlfriend I mentioned earlier, one who became very resentful of me over days for an incident where I couldn't last long in bed. Um, and this was many, many years ago. God, almost, almost 20 years ago, I think. Um, that uh, the fact that her reaction was to condemn me and get resentful at me, rather than turn inward and check, I am not okay with this. How did I attract this? How did I allow this? And what do I want to do now? That's another aspect that I haven't gone into here, and I'm not going to. I'm going to close this in a moment. And this is a domain that, um, like, I'm, I'm articulating it messily right now, but it seems like this is something that is valuable and important to have voiced clearly in the world. That there is a side of the um, the energetic dynamic of the masculine and the feminine that often shows up and is reflected in the physical world, most clearly in heteronormative type interactions. But the, um, that this energetic needs to be clearly understood because right now we are banning the masculine and the feminine both. <laughs> Encouraging people to be numb and weak. There's a little bit of pushback because the species can't survive like that. This is, this is what we're called to. This is what I see us being called to. So understanding this and clearly seeing it and feeling it seems to me like part of the call. Me talking about it is part of both me embodying it more deeply in myself and inviting those who can feel what I'm talking about to pay attention. This is not about ideas. This is about the structure of the energetics of truth. As long as we're going to live in this illusion of time and form, this is part of the key contrast, part of the yin and yang that we are learning to play with. Okay. Um, this is definitely not what I had anticipated talking about today for my penultimate session. It feels good to speak to this and to work on articulating it. If you watch this far, thank you much for listening. And tomorrow, I will wrap up this whole series, and there will be a shift after that in terms of how I show up on this, um, in all of these channels on my Facebook Lives and on YouTube. Right, thank you for your attention.